If a person is reported missing and isn't seen for seven years, they can be declared deceased. The first 48 hours of a missing person's report is crucial in getting evidence. But what happens when people go missing for months, years, and even decades? Hello everybody! Today we'll be looking at three examples of missing cases with happy endings. Now that doesn't mean bad things didn't happen along the way. Obviously a person went missing, which is bad. But in the second story of this video, the person gets abducted, which leads to sexual violence, rape, and other bad things. This is a heads up now for those types of subjects. I don't go into details about that type of thing, but I understand that it's a heavy topic. So if you don't want to watch this video, have a good one. If you want to hear the other two cases, but not that specific case, I'll have timestamps posted on the screen. You'll be able to skip past that story. I'll also say something again before we get into it. If you're new here, welcome, and if you're returning, it's good to see you again. Tanya Ryder Tanya Ryder was a hardworking woman who had dreams of building a home with her husband, Tom Ryder. And by all accounts, Tanya and Tom were happily married. Tanya would work two jobs, one night job and then one morning job. Her night job was at a local grocery store. And on September 19th, 2007, Tanya would finish her shift. Luckily, she would get a couple hours of sleep before having to go to her next job, which she was looking forward to. So she got into her car and headed home. And the last time Tanya would be seen for 8 days was from the camera that picked up her getting inside her car. Tanya would get into an accident on the way home and crashed off into a ravine. Unfortunately, that ravine was covered in blackberry bushes, which are extremely dense and just cover a lot. So much so that nobody noticed a crashed vehicle on the side of the road. Throughout the next 8 days, Tanya would gain and lose consciousness, stating, Maybe if I just let myself go, I thought. I'll wake up safe in my bed at home. But when I opened my eyes, I was still trapped in the car. She was hanging from her seat and pinned against the steering wheel. Her phone was just out of touch, and every time it would light up with a notification, she would try to reach over and grab it, and every time she would be reminded on how bad her injuries were. She described the phone like one of those movie scenes where salvation is literally an arm's reach away, but in Tanya's case, she couldn't get it. And that comparison is fair. Her husband, Tom Ryder, wasn't just shining his shoes the whole time. For the first two days his wife was missing, he didn't notice, but that was because he worked a day job, and the shifts just didn't align. As someone who works a night job, trust me, that makes sense. However, when Tom noticed his wife wasn't at home and she wouldn't be picking up his calls, that's when he got really worried. He notified the police immediately. However, that recording of Tanya getting into her car would justify the police in saying that it wasn't in their jurisdiction. 911, what are you reporting? My wife didn't show up for work last night and she's not home and I haven't heard from her in two days. Can you just check and see if there are any accidents involved? On your rider, R I D E R. I'm not showing any injury accidents in that area, but I can connect you with State Patrol and you can check if there are any injury accidents on the freeway. I'm going to play some of the recorded 911 calls and interviews, and just a heads up, it's hard not to get furious at the police. She's missed work. Have you, did you guys have any arguments? No. Discussions? Just problems? Have you checked any of the other family members in Find the area? House in Maple Valley. Have you contacted any other family members that she may go to? We talked to her family members. Can you send an officer over to at least take the report? Officer is not to take his reports in person. Through red tape, which is just rules and regulations and all those like procedures and stuff, Tom finally got the police to start an investigation. What's going to happen is we're going to list her, and if someone runs her name anywhere in the, in the country, they will know that she is missing and they'll call. But this was days after just brushing Tom off. Reasons given are like she's a grown woman, she can go make her own decisions, or why did you wait two days to file a missing report? Just a bunch of dense mother <laughs> Cut that part out. So during that time, Tom Ryder took matters into his own hands, offering up a $25,000 reward for just information. And he would continuously go up and down the route that Tanya would take to go to work. So when the investigation started, obviously the first person is the significant other. Now, the police have been incompetent this whole time. What you're telling me is unless she turns up dead, you're not going to care. We don't go actively searching for missing people, sir. We don't go out looking for people that are missing. But this is normal, and Tom knew this and volunteered his house, his car, just everything to get searched, just get him cleared as soon as possible. He even was willing to take a polygraph test. As Tom Ryder was about to take the polygraph test, a detective would burst into the room telling Tom that they found Tanya and that she was in critical condition but was alive. After 8 days when the police decided to do their job and began to ping her phone, it took them 20 minutes to find her. Now you want to get more mad? The police response by Deputy Rodney C. Chinnick was quote, We don't take every missing person report on adults. If we did, we'd be doing nothing but going after missing person reports. She does not meet criteria for to take a missing persons report on. 
she doesn't adult. She's not been sick at all. What we're telling you is that she doesn't meet the she doesn't meet the criteria. Tomorrow. Okay. What we're telling you is that she doesn't meet the criteria. Okay. We don't go actively searching for missing people, sir. Well, I'm so sorry you had to do your fucking job, Deputy Doolittle. Sorry, that was disrespectful to Doctor Doolittle. But seriously, let's say I work fast food, and I say to my boss, I can't give a cup to every customer who asks, or else I'll never be able to flip my burgers. I'd get fired. I think I made my point. Tanya Ryder would be found on September 27th, 2007, with extensive injuries, including failing kidneys, a dislocated shoulder, fractured ribs and vertebrae, and her left clavicle was snapped in half. On top of that, she went through those eight days without food or water. She would be placed in a medically induced coma, where doctors began to do multiple operations, debating on if they needed to amputate a leg. This was how serious the damage was. However, Tanya Ryder would live, with full brain functionality and the ability to move her arms and legs. And when Tanya woke up, Tom was right by her side, explaining everything that had happened the past eight days. While Tanya survived, the mental scars will be permanent. When watching interviews, it seems like Tanya still is troubled by those days, which is completely understandable as well as Tom still seems rightly pissed off at the police. Granted, this interview was in 2011, so I hope Tom and Tanya were each able to find some sort of peace. Moving forward, that, that is the, that is your, that's your bottom line. It is. It's the only way to move. Yes, ma'am. Tom Tanya Ryder would release a book that goes into so much more detail than what I'm giving you, and it's called Missing Without a Trace, Eight Days of Horror. I have the Amazon link in the description. All right, heads up. This next story talks about and sexual violence. If you want to skip this, I completely understand. The time is right here. If you want to hear about the story but skip the heavier stuff, I'll have time slots up, so just be on the lookout for that and skip like 10 seconds. I'm not going to harp on it, I'm just going to mention it because it needs to be mentioned. Alright, on to the story of the survivor Jace Lee Dugard. Jace Lee Dugard was the oldest sibling in a small family who resided in South Lake Tahoe. Jace was born on May 3rd, 1980, and was close with her mom and half sister and the family chose South Lake Tahoe because they thought it was safer. Unfortunately for them, two monsters were lurking. Philip Garrido would be half of the team of pieces of shit that would abduct Jace. And if you think that's harsh, listen to this. Sexual violence, rape warning, like heavy, heavy stuff right now. Okay. Garrido went on a raping spree with victims including a 14-year-old girl, a 19-year-old girl, and a 25-year-old woman. He would then go on to sexually assault another woman. And on top of all that, he would be accused of domestic violence and attempted kidnapping by his ex-wife. The sexual assault and rape spree only got him 50 years. Which in my opinion is horse shit. That dude. I don't know if I can say that. Cut his carrot off and then throw him in a deep, deep hole and then just forget about him. However, I am not the law and Gerardo would eventually be released. Where he then abducted Jace Lee Degard with the help of his wife, Nancy Gerardo who Philip had met while in prison. Nancy was visiting her uncle at the time, but still, it's, it's so weird when this type of things happen, and it happens a lot. After Philip was released on June 9th, 1991, he would visit one of his old victim's houses and said, quote, it's been 11 years since I had a drink, which just f***ed this guy. His parole officer brushed off this incident, claiming it would have been too much of a hassle. And on June 10th, 1991, Jace Lee Dugar would walk only a few yards away from her house to the bus stop, and her stepfather would be waiting on the yard just watching her. However, that didn't stop a gray car from pulling up and slowing down right next to Jace, and Jace just thought that they were asking for directions. That's when she was stun gunned unconscious and taken into the vehicle and kidnapped, right in front of her stepfather. On Pioneer Boulevard, the Washone. My daughter was just kidnapped. Top of the hill was a great forge. A man and a woman in the car. The people in the great car was Philip and Nancy Gerardo. Mass searches were launched after Philip and Nancy Gerardo had kidnapped Jace Degard, using dogs, helicopters, and the FBI. However, that led to nothing. The Gerardos successfully got away with kidnapping Jace. Now, Philip Gerardo was a serial with a history of attempted kidnapping and on parole. So you'd think he'd be number one suspect. However, his parole officer didn't suspect a thing, even when searching his house, which he was supposed to do. And he noticed a weird shack in the backyard, but eh, that's whatever, right? By incompetent parole officers who visited the Garrido's home dozens of times while J.C. Dugard was a prisoner there. You got any further questions coming to the office between 8 and 5? This shack is where Jace Dugard was held for 18 years of her life, 170 miles away from her home. 18 years of abuse of all types, as well as 
which led to two pregnancies, one when Jace was 14 and another at 17. Two daughters born in a shack without medical assistance. Jace Dugard would keep a journal in which she would write about feeling unloved and depressed, as well as wondering if her parents were still looking for her. It's on national TV to plead for help. It's pretty, young, innocent child, and it's time that she comes home. But it is also apparent that she was willing to adapt to survive. On July 5th, 2004, Jace would write, It feels like I'm sinking. I'm afraid. I want control of my life. This is supposed to be my life to do with what I like. But once again, he has taken it away. How many times is he allowed to take it away from me? I am afraid. He doesn't see how the things he says make me a prisoner. Why don't I have control of my life? Jace was fully aware the whole time that she was kidnapped. She understood that she was a hostage. I want to make that clear because she's very against Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome is the theory that a hostage can create some sort of bond with their captor. Jace was against this as she puts it. Why do you hate the phrase Stockholm Syndrome so much? Well, it's really, it's degrading. You know, having my family believe that I was in love with this captor and wanted to stay with him. I mean, that is so far from the truth that it, it makes me want to throw up. You know, it's, it's disgusting. I adapted to survive my circumstances. There's just no other way to put it. 18 years after June 10th, 1991, Jace Lee Dugard would officially be rescued and would be taken away from her captors, Philip Gerardo, and piece of shit accomplice, Nancy Gerardo. Now did Philip's parole officer, Edward Santos Jr., find them after multiple checks and searches of their property? No. Well, yes but after 18 years of prior searches. Since are we talking about you getting the kids in the van? I mean, are we talking less than 20? More than 20? It's gonna be less than 20. So what changed? Well, Phillips blew his cover. He went to UC Berkeley, trying to create some sort of religious seminar, but he brought his two daughters with him, which grew suspicion as he was a known criminal for his past, which two UC Berkeley officers did. And so I said, well, whose children are these? And he says, they're mine. So I said, hey, girls, how are you? Come on in. And, and they sort of just kind of stayed propped. Mm -hmm. And so I looked at him, and I look at the girls, and he's going on and on, and he's extremely animated, and they are not. I went to Allison and asked her if she could. I, no, I told her what I had. I said, Allie, this, is, this guy is in my office. He's got these two young girls. Something's not right. And that's when they notified Santos. Once that happened, Santos would visit the house again. However, Santos would tell Phillips, come in the next day so we can talk about this. Now, luckily, Phillips would come in the next day and confess to everything, and Jace was still alive. But still, he had every single piece of the puzzle. He saw the whole picture, and he still allowed one more day for that to have her. Here's the piece of shit parole officer and what he says today. I wish I would have been able to discover you being captive the first day I walked into that house. So I'm sorry for that, but I did my job on that particular day. But I want to make it clear, Philip's mistake, nor the lazy parole officer who decided to do his job was not the reason Jace Lou Dugard survived. She survived because of herself. Jace Dugard would be reunited with her mother on August 27th, 2009. Many difficulties getting back into the world. However, Jace has fought to get that life back. In 2011, she published her first memoir, A Stolen Life, a memoir and founded the Jays Foundation, an organization that provides support to families recovering from abductions and similar traumatic events. It will be linked in the description. In 2012, she received the Inspiration Award at Diane von Furzenberg's third annual DVF Awards at the United Nations. And in 2016, she released another memoir called Freedom, My Book of Firsts, while also appearing in more interviews and podcasts sharing her story. Her books will be linked in the description below. Now, Jace had some horrible acts committed to her. And when I was doing my research in this case, I was just doing research and reading stuff first. And after seeing everything that happened to her, it was really nice watching the interviews she's done recently where she's smiling. Is JC Lee Dugard today re-emerging out of her privacy with lessons she's learned in the past five years. Thank you. About transforming suffering into joy every single day. <laughs> Edgar LaTulip was a 21-year-old man who resided in the home for the developmentally delayed. As Edgar had been described as having the functionality of a child, and unfortunately he wasn't always in the brightest of headspaces, as he had tried to commit suicide in the past. That's important to know, I'm not just throwing that out there, okay? After Labor Day weekend in 1986, 
Edgar had reportedly walked away from his home in Kitchener, Ontario. He would then be missing for decades, with his mother stricken with grief and the police completely flabbergasted. However, 30 years after Edgar had gone missing, he would re-emerge and be reunited with his family. So what happened? Well, Edgar Latulip, going under a different name, would begin having flashes of memories of some sort of life he had before. And these flashes got to the point where he told his social worker about it. You see, Edgar changed his name and moved far away, but was still living how he used to live. And this would be proven after the social worker would look up Edgar Latulip's name on the internet. Some of the memory flashes provided his old name, which is what got the ball rolling for everything to be unraveled. The police in the jurisdiction where the missing case took place began interviewing Edgar, and Edgar's memory came back more and more. And the DNA test would be the nail in the coffin. He was definitely the man who went missing 30 years ago. However, a fall had left him with brain damage, this being the reason why he forgot everything about his life. It isn't known why Edgar Latula began an adventure with no luggage, but at some point during said adventure, Edgar would definitely fall that would leave him with permanent brain damage. Police suspect that Edgar had plans to go to Niagara Falls, as they believed he was going to commit But again, Edgar had the functionality of a child, so he could have just been going out on an adventure. When I was a kid and I had a couple of bucks and quarters, I'd go to Blockbuster and get some candy. If you don't know what Blockbuster is, I swear I'm not that old. But with that figured out, Edgar would finally reunite with his family. The story made national news, however the reunion was held privately. I couldn't imagine how Edgar's mother felt after losing her son for 30 years. Nor could I imagine living 30 years and realizing I used to be someone else. Look. I know a lot of bad things happen with these cases. Tanya and Tom Ryder, from my research, never got any sort of justice from the lackluster police. Jay Stugard was at the mercy of horrible people for years. And Edgar Latulip and his family lost 30 years of that life. Those mental scars are there forever. But the resilience and strength by all of these people is what gave them the best case scenario that the situation allowed for. And I hope I conveyed the good in these stories. But I still know that this was a heavier video. So as you venture to look for another video, I hope you're alright. If you're not, remember, jelly donuts exist. If you're having a bad day, go get one. Alright, bye.